Okay, hello everybody. It's eight o'clock and we're ready to start this evening's webinar. I'm Frances Meek and I'm the Senior Education Officer here at the British Nutrition Foundation. And I have my colleague Alex White with me, who's um, going to be my backup on the IT. So um, if you've got any questions or anything that you want to ask, please do put it in the chat box and uh, Alex will either be able to answer if it's a problem that you've perhaps got about IT, he'll answer it there and then, or if it's something to do with the topic for tonight, then we'll um, answer the questions at, at the end. So a couple of um, pieces of housekeeping before we actually start the presentation. So we are recording tonight's webinar and it will be uploaded tomorrow to the website as a recording and also as the PowerPoint, so you can refer to it again if you'd like to. As I said before, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box. And at the end of the webinar, you will hopefully be redirected to a short online evaluation, which will take you about a minute to complete, and then a downloadable certificate. With the certificate, please download it and add your name and then print it for your records. Um, we have been having a, a few issues with some of the evaluation links. So um, please don't worry if you're not directed to it at the end, we will be sending out an email with the link to the evaluation and then also the link to where the presentation is on the website. We'll do that in the morning. So let's get on and talk about good food hygiene and safety practices. So first of all, what will we be covering? So we're going to be thinking about why are good food hygiene and safety practices important? devising, implementing and monitoring procedures, integrating food hygiene and safety into schemes of work or learning, schemes of learning, lessons and activities, applying good food hygiene and safety knowledge and skills, incorporating food hygiene and safety when assessing practical activities, links to food effects of life resources, and then also suggestions for further sources of information and support. So I thought this was quite important actually to put in right at the beginning, just to think about some of the statistics around food safety and particularly food poisoning and the number of people that uh, get ill through eating contaminated food. And this is actually some statistics from the World Health Organization. And uh, I just couldn't believe this when I saw it. And it's such a shocking figure that across the world, 420,000 people die every year from food poisoning. And that is just horrific, really, um, considering that food poisoning can be avoided and uh, there's absolutely no reason why somebody should become ill and let alone die from it. So um, it's really essential then, if we're going to avoid all these cases of food poisoning, that all food handlers, and as somebody handling food and teaching pupils in school, you are regarded as a food handler, but um, all food handlers, whether they're cooking and serving food to consumers to purchase or cooking for themselves or families at home, they must take the steps necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. And as I said, this actually relates to cooking in school as well. So thinking about you in school and uh, the reason why food hygiene and safety practices are important is first of all, to prevent food poisoning and that's for the pupils, parents and staff. And when I was teaching, actually, I would always say that my most important job in school was to make sure nobody became ill. So obviously I had to teach the pupils the skills, the practical skills, the knowledge, food nutrition, food science, etc. But actually, ultimately, I had to make sure nobody was ill from the food that was produced during the school day in school by the pupils. So ultimately, that's the most important thing. Also, you need to be thinking about your own indemnity. So if something goes wrong in school, you need to make sure that you've done absolutely everything possible to have avoided that. Um, there's also greater emphasis on healthy eating and practical cookery in the curriculum. So therefore, with more practical activities and tasks, there's going to be more possibility that things may go wrong. So therefore, if you've got good hygiene and safety practices, then you're going to be minimising those risks. And then the paragraph at the bottom I thought was quite interesting. And you will notice that there are all those safe highlighted. And it really goes to show that actually thinking about making sure that your pupils are safe in your care is really important. So to ensure that pupils feel safe and are safe 
that's from Ofsted, feel safe and secure, Estyn in Wales, and that school facilities are safe and secure for all, Education Scotland. And in Northern Ireland, effective practice in care and welfare is demonstrated when there is a safe, secure environment for all members of the school community. So actually, it's a very, very important aspect of your job and also of the school's responsibility as well. So we've also got to think about the legal requirements. So um, everything that you do as regard to food hygiene is backed up by some form of, of regulation or act. Now you don't need to know these as such, you just need to know that there are acts and regulations which form the basis of food hygiene and safety in businesses, but also what you're doing in school. Also there are recommendations from the, the Design and Technology Association in England and um, the health and safety checklist for classrooms from the health and safety executive and there's a link to both of those there if you wanted to have a look at those but um, do have a look at the food standards agency website and the food standards scotland website which will give you more information about the legal requirements and then also you might have heard of this term due diligence so due diligence is basically a defense under the law in case something goes wrong with uh, the food that you're handling or, or something happens in school and somebody's made ill or there's an accident. And due diligence means that you've done absolutely everything possible to prevent something from happening, but on this occasion, something has. And in the business world, a food business must be able to demonstrate that it has done everything within its power to safeguard consumer health. And this equates to the classroom a school must be able to demonstrate it has done everything in its power to safeguard pupil health. And as we were saying earlier on, you and school are actually regarded as food handlers. So there are some basic legal requirements that you just need to keep in your mind as you're working. So simply, you need to keep yourself clean, keep the workplace clean, protect food from contamination or anything that could cause harm, Follow good personal hygiene practices, e.g. hand washing, wear appropriate protective clothing, and then tell your employer, and in your case, the head teacher, if you are suffering from or a carrier of a foodborne illness. Now, thinking about food hygiene and safety qualifications, we're often asked about this. And actually, surprisingly, it's not a legal requirement for a teacher of food nutrition to hold a recognised food safety certificate. However, we often find that some local authorities or actually schools themselves may ask that the teachers or a teacher in the school actually has qualification. However, we actually would very much recommend that everybody does have a food safety qualification because not only is it good as far as your sort of due diligence, but also it could help you feel more confident about cooking safely in your classroom, help ensure that you've considered all possible risks, help ensure you demonstrate best practice and be useful to include in your risk assessment and also add to your CPD. So what about food policies and risk assessments? Why are these necessary? So once again, like food hygiene and safety certificates, carrying out risk assessments for food activities is not actually a requirement in all countries of the UK. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, it is strongly advised. Um, the reason for this is that risk assessments help to minimize the risks in practical work, and they can also focus the attention on what might go wrong and how this can be prevented. And also, if we were thinking about education inspections, it's actually highly likely that poor food hygiene and safety would be considered or noticed in an inspection and drawn to the school's attention. Any food safety policies and risk assessments would therefore help to ensure effective procedures were in place and therefore minimizing these issues from happening. So risk assessments could be for recipes, lessons and equipment. And we'll talk about those a little more, bit more now. So I always think risk assessments, actually as food teachers, we do this as a matter of course. <clears throat> and you think that actually going into your room every day, you'd be having a look round, you'd be making sure that all the equipment was safe, you'd be thinking about the ingredients you were going to be using, you'd be thinking about your pupils, and perhaps which ones may be a little bit more um, challenging perhaps in particular lessons. 
but actually risk assessments are proper formal activities and these should actually follow five stages so it's more than what you're doing every day in the classroom so with these formal activities you need to look for the hazards decide who might be harmed and how evaluate the risks and decide whether the existing precautions are adequate or whether more should be done record your findings and then review your assessment and revise it if necessary. Now, risk assessments are usually available from your local authorities, and these are actually generic risk assessments. And we have some on Food Effect of Life as well, which you might find useful. And also in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, they're available from CLEPS, and in Scotland, they're available from SSERC. Now, the important thing to remember with generic risk assessments is that you must, when you get them, you must do what they call adapt and adopt. So by this, it means that you are uh, downloading the risk assessment and then you are actually looking at it and adapting it to your particular setting and your particular pupils. And that's absolutely vital because if something should happen and uh, health and sector health and safety executive come in and do an inspection, they want to see your risk assessments. And um, if they actually see that it's just a generic one printed off a website, actually that could then cause further problems. So you must make sure that it actually does meet your needs. So we've got some on the website, as I said, so we've got some for food rooms, um, we've got some for different activities. This one is one for food sampling. And then this one's for food poisoning. And then this actually is an information sheet which just gives a bit of guidance about how to do the leveling, the risk assessment leveling. So whether it's going to be high, medium or low. So um, if anybody's interested, the link to those resources are, um, is on the screen. Then we need to think once you've got your um, you've thought about your risk assessment, you've got your room set up, you've got your training done, you then need to make sure that you've got robust food hygiene and safety procedures actually in place. So to make sure that you're doing everything possible to uh, prevent food poisoning and accidents in your classroom. So we're just going to go through now some general food hygiene and safety procedures and then we'll move on to a bit more sort of specific ones in a bit. So, um, so the first thing I, I think is important is making sure that you've got a cleaning schedule established for your practical room. And once you've got that, these should be monitored and reviewed. And a cleaning schedule includes everything from all the activities you're going to be doing as a matter of course every day. So that's going to be wiping down the work surfaces and the sinks, cleaning the floor. So things that you may do once a week, like cleaning out the fridges or once a term or even once a year like cleaning out the ovens and it's important that you have that and it's followed and everybody knows who's doing what and whether they need to have um, personal protective equipment and uh, make sure that it's done to the correct standard. The other thing you need to do is make sure that you complete daily fridge temperature checks and record and monitor these so your fridge should be running at, um, at, at least below eight degrees centigrade now that's the legal temperature but for good practice, it should be below five degrees centigrade and you should be recording that and monitoring it. And if there's a problem, then you need to make sure you speak to somebody to get that sorted out. You also need to make sure that you're regularly checking your date marks on ambient children frozen food. And then if you've got any open jars or bottles in the fridge, you need to make sure that you put um, a label on with an opened on date and that will ensure good stock management and then you haven't got anything lurking at the back of the fridge that may cause uh, somebody some harm. You also need to make sure your ingredients are stored correctly before and after use and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. And then avoid washing raw meat to prevent cross-contamination and I know this can sometimes be difficult in schools because for some pupils they've been taught to wash their meat and that's what their parents or their families will teach them to do. However, um, you may remember that the Food Standards Agency did a big campaign about this recently and that was to highlight the fact that if you wash raw meat, it's quite likely that you will be spreading bacteria around the kitchen and that could actually be quite harmful. So within your classroom, that is something that you need to try and avoid if, as long as much as you can. 
And then actually once you've cooked your food, you need to use digital temperature probes to check the core temperature of the food. And uh, you must make sure as well before you use your probe and then afterwards that you're wiping it with an antibacterial wipe. That's just to make sure that you don't get any cross contamination. And then some more general food hygiene and safety procedures. So you're making sure that your hot food is cooled quickly and stored below five degrees centigrade within one to two hours. I know in some schools that can be quite difficult. So some schools have got glass chillers, which will be fantastic. Um, other schools make sure that they only cook small quantities so that they'll cool down fairly quickly. And then you can actually divide portions to make them smaller and they'll cool down more quickly or perhaps use ice baths or water baths. So there are other ways of, of doing it. And then once you've got your cooled dish, you need to make sure that you're storing it appropriately in the food room until the end of the day. Now, I know this is uh, something that some schools don't necessarily do. Perhaps it's difficult for them. But um, I think it's very, very important that you do make sure that you are keeping your food that the pupils have made safe with you in the food room until the end of the day. Um, my concern always was that you had a lesson first thing in the morning and maybe the pupils made spaghetti bolognese and then they took it away with them, they had it in a bag, they put it in the locker, they uh, left school at three or four o'clock, they got the bus home, eventually they reheated at 8 p.m. in the evening. That food has been in the danger zone for a very long time and it's quite possible that bacteria have multiplied and um, it won't be heated to a temperature that would kill it and therefore somebody could become ill from eating it. So it is really recommended that you do keep food in the classroom until the end of the day. Um, then when you've actually got food in your fridge, um, you can see the picture on the screen there, that's nicely organized. Um, but um, it's quite good to make sure that um, any dishes that aren't collected, uh, you put the food into the waste bins after 48 hours for uh, standard dishes, spaghetti bolognese, something like that. Or if you've got a rice dish, it should be 24 hours. Um, that will help you manage your fridge and make sure that you're not keeping food that could cause somebody any harm. And then also, um, this may seem a little bit wasteful, but um, try not to um, take spare ingredients from pupils and accept them into your stores. Um, the reason for this is that um, if you're taking something in, it may not have a label on it. You can't actually guarantee the age or the shelf life, the provenance or the safety of that food. And therefore, you may actually be do introducing an additional risk that isn't actually necessary. Now we're going to be thinking about something a bit more specific. And this is the measures to prevent cross contamination of allergens and the risk of allergic reaction. So as we all know, we have to be really, really careful. There are more and more pupils within our schools that have got severe food allergies. And uh, a lot of them want to do food, which is great, but we need to make sure that we're actually got some procedures and policies in place to make sure it's a safe environment for them. So um, the first thing to do really is to find out from the pupils if anybody has got an allergy or an intolerance. And I'd recommend that a letter is sent out at the beginning of year seven, and uh, you ask the parents to actually let you know what uh, the allergies or intolerances might be. And then you keep that record so that you've got something to refer to. And then each year you actually review that and make sure there haven't been any changes. And then actually, as far as allergenic ingredients are concerned, it's important that you keep those separately and you make sure that they're labelled so there isn't any risk of cross-contamination. And the same with equipment as well. Make sure the equipment is used that, uh, that a child with an allergy is using is cleaned, stored separately, again, to prevent cross-contamination. And then also make sure that everybody using the food room, so that's the staff and the pupils and the recipes that you're making, is aware of the ingredients in those recipes, but also those for food tasting and investigations. And um, hopefully you can see an image on the screen of um, a whiteboard that we saw in a school that we went to for a workshop. And we thought it was actually brilliant planning uh, piece of uh, information that the teachers had put together. And basically what they had done was they had got the FSA allergen menu chart from the FSA website, and they had asked a, a local company to transfer it onto a whiteboard. And then 
every week the uh, teacher wrote up the recipes that the pupils were going to be making and these were the directed pupils and then they would identify the allergens within each of those recipes so it was a really clear obvious record of the allergens that were being used in the week in that classroom and uh, if you can do something like that um, I would thoroughly recommend it and then also thinking about some other specific things, um, tasting and testing, very important part of food nutrition lessons. And um, it's essential to make sure that um, staff and pupils are aware of the allergenic ingredients in the um, foods that you're going to be using for tasting and um, any other activities and investigations that you're going to be doing. But also you need to be thinking about um, actually how the pupils are going to be doing the tasting. So you need to make sure that you've got some really good procedures in place for that so that we're avoiding the uh, double dipping or licking fingers. Um, and as you can see from the picture there, we've got some um, a couple of students doing some tasting and they're using a spoon for that. And uh, they've got some spare spoons. So they've got a clean one each time or they're making sure that they wash it in between. And then also now we're going to be thinking about getting ready to cook. And um, it's important to make sure that um, both the pupils and the staff get into a regular routine for this. And uh, it is particularly important to make sure that um, the staff are modeling all of this for the pupils. We can't expect them to follow the rules if um, the staff aren't doing so as well. So part of getting ready to cook is making sure the ingredients are in the food room at the start of the day and that they're stored in the correct place. So do insist that your pupils do bring their food down to the food room, they're not carrying it around with them. And that any high risk ingredients, so that's meat, fish, dairy products, actually go into the fridge and are stored in the fridge. But also the other lower risk ingredients, so that's going to be flour, uh, rice, pasta, sugar, etc. that still comes into the food room as well, um, because it just means that it's kept safe for when they're ready to actually do their lesson. And then when actually they want to uh, come into your lesson, and get ready to cook. So they should remove blazers and jumpers if appropriate. Uh, remove nail varnish and jewellery. Um, for a staff member, a plain wedding band is fine, but no other jewellery. Uh, watches should be removed as well. Um, keep school bags away from the food area. That's uh, not only is that a food safety issue, but it's also um, a physical safety issue as well, because somebody may trip over a bag. Tie up long hair, ensuring it is not hanging down. Secure long head scarves or coverings. Roll up long sleeves. Thoroughly wash and dry hands and put on a clean apron. And then also we need to think about actually modelling skills. So we're thinking again about the pupils and the staff. But um, the first thing to think about is, is about electrical equipment. We use electrical equipment a lot in food rooms, particularly as the pupils get further up the school. And uh, you can see a picture of uh, a teacher showing a pupil how to use a liquidizer safely. And she's got the lid nice and tight on the top and she's actually covering it with a tea towel as well. So if there are any splashes, um, they'll get absorbed by the tea towel and she won't burn herself. You also need to think about using clean, tidy and effective procedures for practical activities, including demonstrations. And then use the correct equipment for practical activities as well to prevent cross-contamination. And the obvious one for that is using a red chopping board for raw meat. And actually thinking about uh, chopping boards for raw meat, when you actually come to wash these, um, what I always used to do is get the students to wash them, but then I would also put them through the dishwasher as well. So that would mean that they would be sterilised and ready for the next lesson. And then the other thing is making sure that students and also staff use oven gloves when handling hot items. And this is actually putting items into the oven as well as taking them out again. It's actually all too easy just to quickly put something in to the oven without worrying about it. But then you forget that the trays are going to be hot or the shelves and the doors and the surrounds of the oven. And it's quite easy to burn yourself in that way. So we've got some top tips now. Um, one top tip, which um, I really was really pleased when I found out about this um, when I was teaching, is about pre-printing name label labels for dishes made. So this helps manage the, uh, the food in your fridges, but also gives the pupils and parents important information. So as an example of, of a label there, and you'd put on there the name, the date, the class and the year group, 
cooking, reheating, storage instructions, and also allergens. And um, the link on the screen would actually take you to some example labels on the Food of Fact of Life website. Another top tip, we talked about taking temperature records of fridges earlier on. And one of the things we used to do when I was in catering, I was a catering manager um, when I first started working. And one thing we used to do was we actually uh, used to take the temperature of a yogurt in the fridge. And we used to just use a probe to pierce the top of it and take the uh, temperature of the yogurt in the pot. Um, that was actually quite a wasteful thing to do. So um, actually what we then ended up doing in the end was putting a little pot of water in the fridge and um, using that to take the temperature. Now I know a number of people actually just take the temperature from the uh, readout on the, on the door of the fridge or just on the inside, but that will actually give you the temperature of the air in the fridge and not actually of the food or the drink. So actually by taking the temperature of the water, you get a much more accurate temperature to record. And then also some simple other ones. Um, uh, you always need to make sure that your pupils tie their hair up and the staff's hair is tied up as well. So to ensure that, make sure you've got a supply of hair bands, uh, nail varnish remover and plastic gloves and spare aprons are also good. Um, if there's a bottleneck at the hand wash station, um, which often happens, I know some people may use their had their uh, washing up sinks as hand wash stations as well. But if you've just got one hand wash sink and there's a queue, what you could do is divide the class up, get half the class to do um, a task like reading the recipe and the other half to wash their hands and then swap over. Um, and then also another good thing I would recommend is to get a rack to store your chopping boards on. Because unfortunately, if they're washed and then put in a pile, they tend to get uh, smelly and moldy and uh, bacteria can multiply. So um, by having a rack, it means that they dry easily. OK, so we've talked about lots of procedures and policies, but also part of that is making sure that you've got good record keeping. And this is also part of due diligence. So there's a list of uh, records that, that you should keep. So you should keep your daily fridge and freezer temperature record sheets, any risk assessments that you're doing, your cleaning schedules, your COSH record sheets. So that's your care of substances hazardous to health where appropriate. A list of pupils' special dietary requirements, especially allergies, food hygiene and health and safety training certificates if you have them, and then any other departmental food policies or letters to parents, etc. So here's some of the examples oops, sorry, that you might have. So there's the cleaning schedule, there's um, a food and nutrition letter as well that you might want to send out to pupils at the beginning of year seven. And that talks about uh, making sure that food goes into the fridge first thing in the morning, but also asks them to let you know about any allergens or intolerances. And those are on the um, Food Effect of Life website. Okay, so um, very quickly, we're going to talk about integrating food hygiene and safety into schemes of work and lessons and activities. So um, there are a number of resources on the website that will help you with this. But some examples could be um, demonstrate how the use of time plans, flow charts and quality control, control charts can be used to apply theory to practical activities. And there's some examples on the screen of those. Challenge pupils to list food hygiene and health and safety risks during practical activities and or on recipes. And they also set pupils the task or the challenge to be food safety inspectors, which is a really good activity if you are one of those teachers that has got a large class and not enough cookers or workspace. You can divide the class in half and have some of them being food inspectors one lesson, the other half cooking and then swap the next lesson. The other thing to do is make sure that you can remind pupils that not all bacteria is pathogenic or harmful and you actually use recipes that demonstrate how bacteria is used in food production. And uh, we have a nice um, PowerPoint on the uh, website which talks about the microorganisms in food. So you can have a look and you can use a recipe that uh, makes yogurt or bread, but also within that PowerPoint there are some other recipes that might be useful as well. You could teach the four C's, cleaning, cooking, cross-contamination and chilling through watching a fantastic video called Bacteria Bites Business. And this is an old Food Standards Agency website um, video, which is available on their archive website, but um, 
it's great, particularly for sort of year nine onwards. Um, and then also task the pupils to record the food hygiene skills and knowledge they have learned. And that's a really good thing again for due diligence because it actually has shown and it is a record of what you've taught the pupils and they then date it and sign it so that uh, again if there are any issues you can actually produce that in the pupils book and show that what they have been taught. Okay very quickly some other activities so we've got some worksheets we've got some questions and answers uh, we've got some um, more activities this is putting foods into the right place in the fridge or the freezer We've got food labelling because, of course, there's uh, food hygiene information on food labels. Um, we've got the food hygiene code breaking, which I like, and uh, the answer to that is on the bottom. Um, we've got equipment as well because, obviously, we're thinking about safety as well as food hygiene. And then we've got the food route journal, which is great for older pupils, and it's really good for a cover lesson or perhaps if you want to do an extended homework. And then we've got some fantastic quizzes. We've got some online quizzes and also some Kahoot quizzes, which my colleague Alex has put together. And uh, for basically for everything that we've got on the website, all of our topics, you'll find a quiz. So certainly for food hygiene and safety, there'll be a number. And then thinking about actual practical activities. And um, it's absolutely essential that food hygiene and safety is integral when you're assessing your practical activities. And uh, those of you that have been teaching for a while may recognize the uh, worksheet or the um, observation sheet that's on the screen. And this is something that is taken from the License to Cook program, which was from a few years ago. And basically it's an observation sheet that you would use during practical lessons. And you look at um, a pupil's organization, hygiene and safety, food skills, cooking, and also their final dish or dishes. And again, that's quite a nice record as to um, what you've observed in the lesson. And then finally, we're just going to very quickly talk about sources of information and support. So uh, some of you may have heard of a new guide that we've put together called the characteristics of good practice in teaching food and nutrition education in secondary. And the guide is um, aimed at uh, new and practicing secondary teachers. And it's uh, aimed to help teachers become even better teachers. And it covers 11 characteristics, including good food hygiene and safety practices. And um, there's also a new online course that we've put together, which is free, which is based on this. And uh, the link to that is on the screen. And then we've also got a free online course, um, which is food spoilage, hygiene and safety, which again, um, you might find useful. And then we've got some other sources of information and support. So we've got CLEPS, DNT Association, Food Standards Agency, etc. So hopefully those, um, if you wanted to find out something more, then um, you'd be able to go to those websites. Um, talk about the next webinars in a minute, but I think we've got a couple of questions. So we've got, um, okay, so we've got one from Catherine. So how long before I can put cooked food into the fridge after it has been cooked. So basically the aim, Catherine, is to make sure that food is cool enough to go in the fridge within um, an hour to two hours. Normally we say about 90 minutes, but um, basically within two hours really. Um, so you need to think about some of the ways to do that if you haven't got a blast chiller. So um, ideally cooking smaller quantities will help with that. Um, or cutting into portions or um, using an ice bath, ice bath or something. Um, right, and another one. If I'm worried about teaching children with allergies, what is best to do to make sure I am minimizing the risks? So that's a great question. So the um, thing you need to do is make sure that you do, do understand which of your pupils has um, an allergy to um, a food or an ingredient and uh, you do that by uh, checking with the parents and making sure that you have a record that you can refer to. You also need to make sure that everybody's aware of all the ingredients that you're going to be using in your lessons, in your tasting activities and um, investigations and keeping any um, particular um, ingredients that may cause an allergen risk separate from others. So um, if you've got flour, you need to make sure that you keep flour in a pot 
kept keep with a lid on it keep it safe in your um, storeroom if you've got nuts if you're allowed nuts in school that you keep those separate and you keep them labeled um, and also that you have a separate set of equipment for pupils to use and even a separate area if you can to make sure that you're reducing the risk of cross-contamination as much as possible so I think that's all the questions. So um, before we finish, I just want to let you know about what's coming up. So we've got um, a couple of more webinars. We've got one in December, which is going to be Roy talking about ICT literacy and numeracy and food and nutrition lessons. And then in January, we've got um, one with Barbara Monks and it's going to be the functional properties of food. And we're going to be focusing on carbohydrates on this occasion. And we will have a few more webinars being planned over the next few months. We've also got um, a conference coming up in February in London, which is our National Food and Nutrition Education Conference. And this is open to trainee and new and practicing food and nutrition teachers, both primary and secondary. And tickets are a greatly subsidized price of 20 pounds. So um, there's more information on the website about those. So finally, just to say thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I know it's quite something to uh, give up time at eight o'clock in the evening after a busy day at school. So thank you very much. And um, when we finish the webinar, hopefully you'll be directed to the evaluation, which would be grateful if you could complete. Um, if you don't get directed, we will send it to you tomorrow. And um, then also you, once you've completed the evaluation, you'll then be directed to an online uh, certificate which you can um, add your name to and print off and put into your portfolios. So um, thank you very much once again and um, enjoy the rest of your evening.